This is America in the Morning from Westwood One. I'm John Trout. It's Friday, February 9th, 2024. Here's what's coming up on America in the Morning. The Supreme Court sounds broadly skeptical of efforts to keep Donald Trump off this year's presidential ballot. Sagar Magani, Washington. President Biden quick to address the release of a report surrounding classified documents. I'm Clayton Neville. The Federal Communications Commission has outlawed robocalls that contain voices generated by artificial intelligence. I'm Shelley Adler. Stocks open this morning after the S&P 500 index hit that elusive 5,000 mark before pulling back. I'm Jessica Edinger. More plaintiffs have joined a lawsuit alleging they were sexually abused as children while incarcerated at Maryland's juvenile detention facilities. I'm Jackie Quinn. Are you excited about Sunday's Super Bowl? According to a new poll, a lot of Americans are. I'm Donna Warner. All ahead on America in the Morning. The U.S. Supreme Court appears set to rule that states cannot disqualify Donald Trump from the presidential ballot. Our top story from correspondent Sakir Magani in Washington. After landmark arguments, the Supreme Court seems poised to reject efforts aimed at kicking Donald Trump off this year's presidential ballot over the Capitol riot. We'll hear argument this morning in case 23719, Trump versus Anderson. Mr. Mitchell? The arguments were over Trump's appeal of a Colorado high court ruling that he's ineligible for the ballot for taking part in an insurrection, citing an obscure Civil War era clause. The Colorado Supreme Court's decision is wrong and should be reversed for numerous independent reasons. Trump lawyer Jonathan Mitchell says allowing the ruling to stay in place would essentially nullify voting rights. Take away the votes of potentially tens of millions of Americans. But Jason Murray, who argued for the Colorado voters who brought the case. By engaging in insurrection against the Constitution, President Trump disqualified himself from public office. There was a little discussion thereafter about insurrection. Instead, both the liberal and conservative justices were skeptical about a state's bid to keep Trump off the ballot. I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. That was liberal Elena Kagan, for whom Murray once was a clerk. Conservative Chief Justice John Roberts fears a ruling for Colorado would embolden other states to target candidates they don't like. In very quick order, I would expect, um, although my predictions have never been correct, uh, I would expect that uh, you know, a goodly number of states will say, uh, whoever the Democratic candidate is, you're off the ballot, and others uh, the, for the Republican candidate, you're off the ballot. The justices could act quickly, possibly by Super Tuesday on March 5th, when Colorado and 14 other states will hold primaries. A definitive ruling for Trump would largely end efforts to keep his name off the ballot, while a ruling to uphold the Colorado decision would amount to a stunning declaration that Trump did engage in insurrection and is barred from holding office. The justices could also opt for a less conclusive outcome, knowing the issue might eventually come back to them. Sagar Magani, Washington. President Biden addressed the American people Thursday night following the release of a special counsel report into then Vice President Biden's handling of classified documents. Correspondent Clayton Neville has that story. Special counsel Robert Hur said in the report that his investigation found President Biden did willfully retain and share highly classified information when he was a private citizen. Some of the information is said to have surrounded military and foreign policy in Afghanistan. But Hur said that criminal charges are not warranted against Biden in the case. In the report, he referred to the president as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a bad memory. Yeah, my memory is fine. My memory, take a look at what I've done since I've become president. President Biden addressed the nation after the report was released and spoke to reporters. I'm well-meaning and I'm an elderly man and I know what the hell I'm doing. I've been president and I put this country back on its feet. I don't need his recommendation. The president said that he cooperated completely with the investigation. I did not throw up any roadblocks. I sought no delays. In fact, I was so determined to give the special counsel what he needed, I went forward with a five-hour in-person, five-hour in-person interview over two days. The report indicated Biden shared the information with a ghostwriter, which he denies, but her suggested the DOJ would not be able to prove Biden's intent because of an advanced age that made him forgetful. 
Biden went after the special counsel about asking to share what he remembered about his son Bo's death. How in the hell dare he raise that? Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. Biden's lawyers are publicly disputing the report's assessment of the president's memory and the president himself quick to try to clear his name. The decision to decline criminal charges was straightforward. The evidence suggests that Mr. Biden did not willfully retain these documents. He pointed directly to former President Trump, who's being investigated after classified documents were found at Mar-a-Lago. After giving multiple chances to return classified documents to avoid prosecution, Mr. Trump allegedly did the opposite. According to the indictment, he not only refused to return the documents for many months, he also obstructed justice by enlisting others to destroy evidence and then to lie about it. President Trump says the effort to go after him is a witch hunt. And as the campaign season ramps up, many political experts believe that the Biden campaign will tread lightly when it comes to mentioning the Trump classified documents case. I'm Clayton Neville. The Federal Communications Commission halts artificial intelligence. That's when America in the Morning returns after these messages. Welcome back. This is America in the Morning. A check on today's weather first with a look back at what happened yesterday. Here's AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy. Yesterday saw an unusual set of circumstances come together to produce severe thunderstorms through portions of Illinois into Wisconsin, which yielded strong winds, hail, and even a couple of tornadoes. This was the first tornado reported in recorded history in Wisconsin for the month of February. As quickly as those pieces came together yesterday, those circumstances will not be the same today with only showers and maybe a rumble of thunder early on expected along the cold front from eastern Michigan early this morning into New York and then New England this afternoon. This front will continue southward through the Ohio Valley into the southeast and even into eastern Texas with showers along it. There will even be some steadier rain developing in parts of eastern Tennessee, which will expand at night through the rest of Tennessee into Arkansas and northeast Texas, where there can also continue to be some thunder. The center of the storm moving through with this uh, cold front will be in the northern plains, and the colder air will follow with some snow showers. This will be a sharp contrast from the recent mild weather, but it still remains well above the historical average. That milder weather will continue to build into the eastern U.S. ahead of the aforementioned front. Temperatures once again soar well above historical averages by as much as 30 degrees. In the west, there will be a broad area of low pressure, leading to widespread rain and snow showers through the Intermountain region from Montana and Idaho, southward to Nevada, Utah, and Colorado. Each of these areas could see a few inches of snow in the higher elevations. However, another developing system will move in late today and tonight, starting in the northwest. That's the weather across America. It'll be a mild day in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, with some sunshine and a high of 57. Reno, Nevada will be chilly today with mostly cloudy skies and a high of 42. That's the nation's weather. I'm AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and YouTube. Just search America in the Morning in your favorite listening app. I'm John Trout. The families who lost loved ones in Hawaii's deadliest wildfire could receive up to $1.5 million each from a victim's compensation fund if they agree not to pursue litigation. Governor Josh Green made the announcement six months to the day that the wildfire on Maui killed 100 people and displaced nearly 10,000. It's believed that as many as 5,000 people are still living in hotel rooms after their homes were burned to the ground. Numerous lawsuits have been filed. Questions are being raised over the police and fire response, as well as Hawaiian Electric, who, despite red flag warnings, did not preemptively shut off power to the area. It's believed an electrical line blown down by high winds may have sparked the inferno. The Federal Communications Commission has outlawed robocalls that contain voices generated by artificial intelligence. Correspondent Shelley Adler reports. You may remember that AI-generated robocall that mimicked President Biden's voice to discourage people from voting at last month's New Hampshire primary. We know the value of voting Democratic when our votes count. It's important that you save your vote for the November election. Well, the FCC wants to put an end to that. The agency says it will find companies that use AI voices in their calls or block the service providers that carry them. It also opens the door for call recipients to file lawsuits and give 
gives state attorneys general a new mechanism to crack down on violators. Those who break the law can face steep fines, maxing out at more than $23,000 a call. I'm Shelley Adler. Record-setting day on Wall Street. That in business headlines when America in the Morning continues after these messages. This is America in the Morning. You may want to think twice about snacking before you head to the airport. Scandinavian carrier Finnair announced it'll start weighing passengers before each takeoff. Finnair has been voluntarily weighing passengers at their hub in Helsinki and will now expand the program to add more volunteers and use the weight data for aircraft balance and loading calculations starting in 2025. While no U.S. carrier dares to initiate such a program, Korean Air and Air New Zealand conducted a weighing program last year. Weighing in on Friday Business, here's CNBC's Jessica Ettinger. Wall Street opens this morning after a winning day for the major averages, and the S&P 500 index touched 5,000. Well, we're like, welcome right there. Yeah, oh, oh, there we got it. We're in at the close. Look at that. We got it right at the close. Albeit briefly. Albeit briefly, CNBC's Mike Santoli and Scott Wapner there at the closing bell. The index did settle out three points below 5,000. Some investors not too worried about that milestone. We've had a huge move over the past year, and we just the markets kind of keep running. 5,000 um, is it behavioral? Sort of, a, in some ways, it's just a number that's kind of meaningless. You know, whether it's 49.99 or, or above, does it matter? Looks pretty good. It's more than nothing. That's a good thing. FBB's Mike Bailey on CNBC. Another big winner yesterday was Arm. Its shares soared 60% in one day on Blockbuster quarterly results and a strong forecast from the chip designer, which is bullish on artificial intelligence. Disney shares had their best day yesterday in more than three years. The Mouse House up 11%. It's been touting its deals with Fortnite's parent company, Epic Games, and of course with Taylor Swift. Disney Plus will stream her concert movie next month that includes an extra four songs. Mexico has now surpassed China as the leading source of goods imported into the U.S., That's the first time in more than 20 years. Sports apparel companies have been watching closely law enforcement in Las Vegas, cracking down on fake merchandise this week ahead of the Super Bowl on Sunday. Law enforcement showing off a million dollars worth of counterfeit jerseys, T-shirts, caps, and more that was seized last weekend. Jessica, this recent spike in the markets is tied to consumer spending, but how so? Well, you're right. Investors do watch consumer spending closely, makes up about two-thirds of U.S. economic growth, and it softened in January in the latest Bank of America Consumer Checkpoint report. But it may not be pointing to any problems with the economy. There may be a simple reason for it. We had extreme cold in the Midwest and the South. There was a lot of precipitation on the East Coast. Restaurant spending, which had been growing at 3.6%, in January was down 3.2 percent. People don't go out. Bank of America's Liz Everett Chrisberg on CNBC about on today's watch list, we get earnings from PepsiCo and AMC Networks. Today is Lunar New Year's Eve. The financial markets are closed in China and through much of Asia ahead of the Year of the Dragon, which begins tomorrow. Another chance at a New Year's resolution. CNBC's Jessica Ettinger. When we return on America in the Morning, alleged sexual abuse at a juvenile detention center after these messages. This is America in the Morning. Dozens more plaintiffs have joined a lawsuit alleging they were sexually abused as children while incarcerated at Maryland's juvenile detention facilities. Correspondent Jackie Quinn reports. 
More than 60 new plaintiffs joined the lawsuit, bringing the number up to about 200. Among them, a woman who said she was seven when she was abused by a staff member who offered to protect her at the Waxter Children's Center in Maryland, which recently closed. Many others said they were given food or phone calls to lure them in or threatened with violence or solitary confinement if they didn't comply. Maryland officials watching the Catholic Church sex abuse scandal recently lifted the statute of limitations for child sex abuse litigation. I'm Jackie Quinn. For the 51st time, this network, Westwood One, will broadcast the Super Bowl. Kevin Harlan handles play-by-play for the 14th straight year. I know he's excited. Correspondent Donna Warder reports many Americans are, even if it's not for the game itself. Four in 10 adults who answered the survey by the Associated Press and the Newark Center for Public Affairs Research say they're extremely or very excited for at least one part of the Super Bowl day's festivities. Whether it's the game on CBS, the commercials, the halftime show, or Animal Planet's Puppy Bowl. A quarter of U.S. adults say they're excited for the actual game when the Kansas City Chiefs try to win their second title in a row. But the poll was conducted before the Chiefs and the San Francisco 49ers were cemented to appear in this year's Super Bowl in Las Vegas. Another 27 percent say they're somewhat excited for the game, and about half say they're not too or not at all excited. I'm Donna Warder. America in the Morning for Friday, February 9th, 2024, is produced by Jeff McKay, senior producer Kevin Delaney. I'm John Trout. This is Westwood One. This is America in the Morning from Westwood One. I'm John Trout. Coming up this half hour. The Justice Department says Joe Biden willfully kept and disclosed classified material. Sagar Magani, Washington. Tucker Carlson sits down for an interview with Vladimir Putin. I'm John Stolnes. The U.S. military responding to a deadly helicopter crash. I'm Clayton Neville. GOP's Haley says caucus was rigged. Seven people indicted in the assault of two New York City police officers. I'm Pamela Furr. A former advisor to then-President Donald Trump has lost his bid to stay out of prison while he appeals a conviction. I'm Jackie Quinn. Musician Usher is ready for Sunday's Super Bowl halftime show in Las Vegas. I'm Archie Zaroleta with the latest. Back after these messages. Welcome back. This is America in the Morning. More on those severe storms in the Midwest from yesterday. First, a look at what's happening out west with AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy. In the west, there will be a broad area of low pressure leading to widespread rain and snow showers through the Intermountain region from Montana and Idaho southward to Nevada, Utah, and Colorado. Each of these areas could see a few inches of snow in the higher elevations. However, there is another developing system late today and tonight, starting in the northwest with some steadier rain and snow developing in western Oregon and then quickly strengthening as it moves into the southwest tonight. As it reaches Arizona, snow will increasingly develop through the northern mountains before heading into New Mexico and Colorado. This will be a storm we are watching this weekend into early next week for the potential of severe thunderstorms in the southern plains and northeast. Severe weather did develop in parts of Illinois and Wisconsin yesterday, and as quickly as those pieces came together yesterday, the situation will not be the same today with only showers, maybe an early rumble of thunder expected along the front from eastern Michigan early this morning into New York and then New England this afternoon. This front will continue southward through the Ohio Valley into the southeast and even into eastern Texas with showers along it, and there will even be some steadier rain developing in parts of eastern Tennessee, which will expand at night through the rest of Tennessee into Arkansas and then northeast Texas, where there could also be some thunderstorms. The center of the storm from this cold front in the northern plains will have colder air following it with some snow showers. This will be a sharp contrast from the recent mild weather, but it will still remain above the historical average. That milder weather will continue to build into the eastern U.S. ahead of the aforementioned front, with temperatures once again soaring well above historical average by as much as 30 degrees. That's the nation's weather. I'm AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and YouTube. Just search America in the Morning in your favorite listening app. I'm John Trout. 
The Justice Department says President Joe Biden willfully kept and disclosed classified material while he was a private citizen. Washington correspondent Sahir Magani is in with the special counsel's report, which did not charge the president with any crimes, also questioned Biden's memory, which led to an evening press conference where the commander in chief angrily refuted the claims. I was pleased to see they reached the conclusion I believed and knew all along they would that there are no charges should be brought in this case. As many of you know, this was an exhaustive investigation going back literally more than 40 years. 40 years when I became a United States senator as a kid. The documents were found in a cardboard box in his Delaware garage, in his basement and elsewhere. It's a hard assessment of his handling of sensitive material, but it also clears the president of any criminal wrongdoing. The special counsel in my case decided against moving forward with any charges. And this matter is now closed. <laughs> I'll continue to do what I've always done. Stay focused on my job, like you do, of my job of being president. The president at a Democratic retreat saying he cooperated fully with the year-long probe. Special counsel acknowledged I cooperated completely. I did not throw up any roadblocks. I sought no delays. In fact, I was so determined to give special counsel what they needed, I went forward with a five-hour in-person interview over the two days of October the 9th, 8th and 9th, last year, even though Israel had just been attacked by Hamas on the 7th. It's separate from the one charging Donald Trump with illegally hoarding top secret records at his Florida estate. After given multiple chances, this is the continuation of the quote, he returned classified documents and avoided, to avoid, and avoided prosecution. Mr. Trump allegedly did the opposite. This is the continuing quote. According to the indictment, he has not only refused to return documents for many months, he also obstructed justice by enlisting others to destroy evidence and then lie about it. Biden's probe likely blunts his efforts to hammer Trump for his as they move toward a likely November showdown. Trump says this is a two-tier justice system, and Biden's case was far more severe than his. Sagar Magani, Washington. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky sacks a top army general and the Kremlin's invasion of Ukraine approaches its two-year anniversary. This as Russian President Vladimir Putin appeared with former Fox News host Tucker Carlson for an interview on the history and current situation of their war with Ukraine. John Stolnes has a recap. For nearly two hours broadcast on X, formerly Twitter, Carlson sat listening to Putin deliver history lessons for nearly half-hour stretches, talking about why Russia had the right to invade Ukraine and take as much of their territory as possible. Carlson asked Putin why he simply doesn't pick up the phone and call President Biden and start negotiating an end to the fighting. If you really want to stop fighting, you need to stop supplying weapons. It will be over within a few weeks. Carlson routinely appeared sympathetic to Putin and Russia on his former Fox News show. He did not address Russian attacks on Ukrainian civilians or other war crimes alleged by the Ukrainians and independent observers, nor the poisoning and jailing of political dissenters in his country. Putin warned against America getting too directly involved in the fighting in Ukraine. If somebody has the desire to send regular troops, that would certainly bring humanity to the brink of a very serious global conflict. This is obvious. Do the United States need this? What for? And he claimed America's arming of Ukraine is only prolonging the conflict. Wouldn't it be better to negotiate with Russia, realizing that Russia will fight for its interests to the end? And realizing this, actually return to common sense, start respecting our country and its interests, and look for certain solutions. Carlson did forcefully try to get Putin to admit that Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich was not a U.S. spy and urged Putin to release the reporter to him. We have done so many gestures of goodwill out of decency that I think we have run out of them. We have never seen anyone reciprocate to us in a similar manner. However, in theory, we can say that we do not rule out that we can do that. Gershkovich has been in prison for the last year. The journal reiterated he was not a spy and urged once again for the Russians to immediately release him. I'm John Stolnes.
The U.S. military has lost five Marines killed in a helicopter crash in California. That story from correspondent Clayton Neville. The CH-53E Super Stallion Chopper went down in the mountains near San Diego during a routine training flight. The 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing says the aircraft was traveling from Creed Air Force Base north of Las Vegas to Marine Corps Air Station Miramar in San Diego. All five Marines on board were killed. President Biden and First Lady Jill Biden released a statement saying they're heartbroken over the crash. As the Department of Defense continues to look into what happened, the president insists that the five Marines represent the best of the United States. This is a local investigation is underway. The helicopter was found in Pine Valley, California. That's about 50 miles outside San Diego. Heavy snow had blanketed the area with a historic storm in the region, making conditions tough to navigate. The aircraft, no stranger to tragedy. In 2018, four CH-53E Super Stallion crew members were killed in a crash near the U.S.-Mexico border. Two years before that, a collision between two of the choppers killed 12 people, and more than 30 were killed in a CH-53E crash in Iraq in 2005. Officials say it's all part of an ongoing investigation. I'm Clayton Neville. Coming up, cops assaulted, migrants indicted. That story, When America in the Morning, continues after these messages. This is America in the Morning. I'm John Trout. Donald Trump was declared the landslide winner of the Nevada GOP caucus, which came two days after the Silver State also held a primary where Trump's name was not on the ballot. In that primary, Nikki Haley came in second place to a line called None of These Candidates. Haley did not participate in the caucus, saying that contest was rigged in favor of the former president. Last night, Trump also notched a win in the U.S. Virgin Islands GOP caucus, taking 74 percent of the territory's votes. Seven migrants have been indicted in connection with the assault of two New York City police officers who were patrolling Times Square, an attack caught on video. Pamela Furr has details. This assault... Uh, as it did to many of you, sickened me uh, and outraged me. That's Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg at a press conference yesterday announcing... A grand jury has returned an indictment on seven individuals for their roles in assault on two police officers in Times Square on January 27th. Now, these seven men are believed to be migrants seeking asylum. The melee was caught on video, and NYPD have been using these images in the video to identify those involved. They believe there may be at least seven more who have not been identified. Mayor Eric Adams. We are going to pursue anyone that commits a crime. If they are long-standing New Yorkers or if they are new arrivals, and that's what we're doing. Adams also called on the city council to renew its cooperation with ICE so the two agencies can formally work together. He told reporters he believes repeat offenders, which some of these in custody may be, should be deported. Meanwhile, the officers sustained minor injuries and were treated at the scene. I'm Pamela Furr. A former advisor to then-President Donald Trump has lost his bid to stay out of prison while he appeals a conviction for contempt of Congress. That story from correspondent Jackie Quinn. Peter Navarro, a close advisor to then-President Trump, was found guilty of defying a subpoena issued by the committee investigating the January 6th insurrection. He was sentenced to four months in prison. Navarro filed an appeal last month. His comments afterward drowned out by detractors outside the courthouse. Whether a senior White House aide and alter ego of the president can be compelled to testify. A U.S. District Judge, Amit Mehta, says Navarro must report to serve his sentence unless a federal appeals court intervenes. Navarro had said his prosecution stems from political bias, but the judge called that a, quote, cynical, self-serving claim. I'm Jackie Quinn. Six people from the same family are now presumed dead after a shooting spree at a fire at a home in East Lansdowne, Pennsylvania, outside Philadelphia. Police report the fire was set after the shooting and engulfed the house. 
The Delaware County District Attorney's Office said police responded after receiving a 911 call about a family domestic argument. It was soon after that shots were fired and then the fire started. Three of those believed to have died were children and the death toll includes the alleged shooter. America in the Morning continues. A volcano in Iceland, a short drive from that nation's capital city and its international airport, is erupting for the third time since December, spewing molten lava into the sky. Correspondent Karen Shamas reports. Dramatic video from an Icelandic civil defense helicopter shows jets of lava soaring into the darkened night skies. The eruption began early morning along a nearly two-mile fissure over two miles northeast of the coastal town of Grindavik, according to the Icelandic Meteorological Office. In Grindavik, around 3,800 people were evacuated before a previous eruption in December. Volcanologist Dave McGarvey told the AP the recent eruption is similar to the earlier two in the past few months. We have magma collecting beneath a particular part of the, the ground in the area, and then every so often it reaches a point where it uh, moves sideways and then erupts along a crack in the ground. The Icelandic Meteorological Office said that lava was flowing to the west and there was no immediate threat to Grindavik or to a major power plant in the area. I'm Karen Shamas. With breakfast and coffee out of the way, time to head to the bathroom, but that toothbrush, that internet-connected toothbrush, could it be used to take down Homeland Security? Well, it's theoretically possible. Here's our Chuck Palm with that in today's Tech Report. A post from The Independent earlier this week made a claim that millions of hacked internet-capable toothbrushes could be used in a massive cyber attack. While it is theoretically possible, internet-connected devices could be used to create what is called a botnet, allowing them to perform a distributed denial-of-service attack that overloads website servers with huge amounts of traffic. A Swiss newspaper, the Argauer Zeitung, first reported the threat, stating that major websites could be knocked offline as a result of such an attack. However, it was initially reported as an actual incident, but Fortinet has since clarified to the Independent that it was a hypothetical scenario. A spokesperson from FortiGuard Lab said the topic of toothbrushes being used for a DDoS attack presented during an interview as an illustration of a given type of attack and is not based on research from Fortinet or FortiGuard Labs. Apparently, there was something lost in translation. Leave a comment at allthetoptech.tech. I'm Chuck Palm. On the Friday before the big game, here's our Robert Workman with sports. Super Bowl 58 is Sunday in Las Vegas. The Chiefs against the 49ers. San Francisco, a slight favorite. NFL honors last night. Lamar Jackson of the Ravens won his second MVP. He got 49 of 50 first place votes. 49ers running back Christian McCaffrey was named Offensive Player of the Year. Browns defensive end Miles Garrett won the award on defense. His coach, Kevin Stefanski, was named Coach of the Year. And Joe Flacco, the last of five different starting quarterbacks in Cleveland this season, was named Comeback Player. The Texans swept the rookie awards. Quarterback C.J. Stroud and defensive end Will Anderson Jr., the Walter Walter Payton Man of the Year, Steelers defensive end Cameron Hayward. Five new members of the Pro Football Hall of Fame were also announced. First-time nominee Julius Peppers, fourth all-time in sacks, led the list. He'll head to Canton along with another defensive end, Dwight Freeney, linebacker Patrick Willis, receiver Andre Johnson, and return specialist Devin Hester, who took a record 19 kicks to the house. NBA trade deadline Thursday afternoon. No super splashy moves, some fine-tuning for the playoff run. On the court last night, wins for West co-leaders Minnesota and Denver. The Cavaliers crushed the Nets for their eighth straight win and 16th in the last 17. Portland's Jeremy Grant had a career-high 49, but it wasn't enough. The Pistons erased a 23-point deficit and beat the Blazers in overtime. College basketball number 8 Arizona led by 16 at halftime at Utah, but wound up needing triple overtime to subdue the Utes. Hockey, the Bruins blanked the Canucks 4-0 as the league's top two teams squared off. Hurricanes topped the Avalanche, Martin Natchez with his first career hat trick. And the Flyers down the Jets, Travis Konechny, had a Gordie Howe hat trick. A goal, an assist, and a fight. That's Friday Sports. Robert Workman with sports. Taylor, Travis, Usher, and Reba. When America in the Morning continues after these messages. Welcome back. This is America in the Morning. This weekend's not just about Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey, and the Super Bowl. As Hollywood has lined up some counter-programming to compete with the big game, Kevin Carr has a sneak peek at Lisa Frankenstein. 
For Super Bowl weekend, a new movie targets an audience likely skipping the big game, namely goth girls, 80s misfits, and anyone indifferent to Taylor Swift. Lisa! Does he have more of a basketball bod or a football bod? He doesn't play sports. Lisa Frankenstein is an 80s rom-com resurrected as a horror-adjacent comedy. Written by Oscar winner Diablo Cody, the story follows a troubled high school girl who pines for the love of a boy buried in an abandoned cemetery. That's really weird, Lisa. After a freak lightning strike brings him back to life, the girl helps him become more human. I want to help you, but Taffy says it's a waste of time to try and fix a boy. This tale of reanimated love isn't entirely new and relies on a fresh spin mixing neon lit 80s nostalgia with Cody's sarcastic writing style. I'm not making any more comments. <laughs> You can talk to my lawyer. Really hope this goth phase ends soon. Unfortunately, the hip, punchy, honest blog flair that won Cody the Oscar for Juno fails to hold together the disjointed plot. There are plenty of clever zingers, but it's missing overall focus and a moral center. I have an idea. There are bad people out there. That hand is going to do terrible things. Lisa Frankenstein makes for a fun trailer, but the energy level for even the breezy 93-minute running time is painfully lacking. No, don't cry. <gasps> Your tears smell so bad. Lisa Frankenstein gets two lightning bolts out of five. I'm Kevin Carr, and that's the way I see it. Music's Usher is ready for Sunday's Super Bowl halftime show in Las Vegas. As entertainment correspondent Margie Zaraletta reports, country music legend Reba McIntyre will begin the game by singing the national anthem, and she says she's more than ready. Well, I prepare by being prepared. <laughs> I've been singing the national anthem in the shower <laughs> when we get in the car. Rex, my boyfriend, is a huge football fan, played all sports when he was going to school. And so he'll say, okay, sing it one more time. I said, I think I know the words real good right now, so I'm all right. <laughs> Usher says the challenge of playing halftime at the Super Bowl is trying to cram a 30-year career into 13 minutes. He says he always has had a vision for success, even as a child. You know those kids who, like, take a mic in hand and they're <laughs> singing and they're, like, believing in themselves and they look in the mirror and they're singing to an audience that's not there? I'm that kid. Usher plans to use elements from his Las Vegas show, including roller skating. I thought about a few moments that were special in dance. I thought about some things that I had created here in Las Vegas, i.e., skating and doing things that I had not, you know, done on stage up until this point. I'm Archie Zaraleta. America in the Morning for Friday, February 9th, 2024 is produced by Jeff McKay, senior producer Kevin Delaney. I'm John Trout. This is Westwood One.